Vaccination, uh, the vaccination of the younger kids injected into that model. I know that when our model is are beginning to work at this, um, you will find that if you have kids five to age five to eleven vaccinated, it will make a difference um, over the uh, longer term in terms of transmission. For this fourth wave, of course, this this is the way for that. And for subsequent waves, you may see it reducing the peak of the wave, or we um, perhaps reducing the duration of any subsequent bumps that you might have. Um, so, but uh, it is the, the, the it's just where it was right now. So we'll do a lot of that through the future modeling sessions. Okay, uh, hello. Um, oh, isn't this fun? <laughs> so let's just check and see if the live stream is working. Uh, there's a bit of a delay, obviously. So, um, and I've been getting warnings, your Zoom meeting is at risk. So it's been posted online and doesn't have. Okay, here's a link to that post. Search social meetings and share them with potential intruders. Okay, but okay, strongly remove or report the public post. No, because I did it. Delete the meeting and create a new one. No, waiting room. I have a waiting room. I'm pretty sure. And uh, well, here we have another participant, Matthias Melcher. I guess I don't have a waiting room. <laughs> uh, oh, I should put my earphones on. Oh, that's me. Okay. All right. So let's turn off the streaming version. Okay. Boy, that really is delayed the live stream. Um, so Matthias, I should be able to hear you, but I'm not hearing anything at the moment. Oh, I see you even. 
I see Bernie. Hi, Bernie. And uh, I see Matthias. I've got some pop-up over here. Okay, and Margaret. Okay, awesome. So we actually have people. That's great. I thought there might not be any people. Um, can one of you talk so I can see if I can hear you? Nice to see you, Stephen. Ah, uh, nice to meet you guys. Excellent. Margaret, hi. So, okay, this is awesome. So I've been having horrible, horrible web server problems. Uh, so much so that uh, I've turned off all generated page displays. I'm hitting my resource limits. Uh, I believe it's probably my fault. <laughs> Uh, there's probably a programming error in there somewhere causing a loop, but I don't know what it is. Um, and I can't seem to find the problem. So there we go. Uh, so, uh, so people who expected to go on the website and watch in the activity center, etc., aren't able to watch this meeting, which is unfortunate. I'm sort of trying to step my way through the problem, but it's really difficult when I'm able to get one page load every five minutes. Uh, so I have no idea what's causing it, but it's very mm -hmm. weird. So uh, uh, enough about my server problems. Um, so instead of me launching into something, oh, it's Juan Domingo Fernos. Welcome. Um, let, let me uh, get reactions from you guys um, to this point. Um, how have you been finding the course? And I, I realize we haven't actually launched into the subject of the course yet, but just the, the setup and the MOOC and the initial instructions, uh, how have you been finding that? Got a thumbs up from Matthias. Yeah, it's been good if I may say. I haven't put enough time in, Stephen, so I apologize, but uh, I watched the uh, video you had on uh, setting up a blog and subscribing it uh, or adding it to the course newsletter. So I'll, I'm working on that. And I hope to have that to you today. And um, I'm looking awesome. forward to this. So uh, I'm looking forward to be fully engaged as we go through here. Something I've noticed about this, June, this Zoom setup, um, is if I talk while you're talking, it cuts you off. So that's interesting. I wonder if that works in reverse. If you speak while I'm speaking, does it cut me off? I bet you it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So uh, the main purpose of this uh, session, or what I, what I had in mind talking about, is just the, the concept of participating in a CMOOC generally, because it's quite a contrast to your regular everyday course where you're stepped through learning activities as a group and everybody does the same thing and there are learning objectives and all of that. So a number of you have already taken well, actually, I see Matthias and Margaret, you both have your uh, mics muted. Are you able to speak and just don't want to, or are you not able to speak? I think I can speak. I just don't have anything intelligent to say. Okay. I'm sure you do, but uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll put that down as choosing not to speak at the moment. Matthias, how about you? Are you able to speak? You're not able to speak. Okay, so that'll limit your participation somewhat. That's too bad. Uh, I'll keep the uh, chat open to have to keep an eye on what you say. So if you have a comment to make, just make it in the chat. Switching off your cameras, you're getting bandwidth warnings. Okay. Oh, yeah, from Margaret. Yeah. Yeah, that's the problem with this whole concept of online learning is bandwidth. And uh, I still don't think it's been solved personally. Uh, so... So there's, yeah, so basically, Bernie, it's you and me conversing <laughs> with hey. Margaret interjecting once in a while. So I have, you, 
have have you taken any of the CMOOCs from me before? No, but uh, I saw you at a conference about 15 years ago or 10 or 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it influenced me back then, Stephen, you influenced me back then. So, uh, and I've been subscribing and I, I follow your, your, your writings and uh, it's influenced my teaching constantly and uh, or continually. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm a really appreciate the opportunity to say hello to you and I'm indebted to you. I am indebted to you. Um, so I'm looking to just stay sharp here. And uh, you're going to force me to do come out of my uh, um, sort of some of the patterns maybe I've fallen into. I'm pretty not a bad online teacher, uh, but I know there's always something to learn. And you're definitely, you know, looking at all, all kinds of things. So I'm looking forward to participating. And um, it's important. It's just, uh, I'm a teacher, so I need to be effective online. And I can't just sit back. I need to be uh, engaging people. And uh, so uh, I, I'm, it's a real pleasure to, to be here with you on this, this journey, period. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Uh, I always worry uh, whenever I do any of these things is because I do things quite a bit differently from, shall we say, best practices. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was worried, does that make me a bad online teacher? Um, but I, I run that risk. Margaret, have you taken any uh, CMOOCs that I've offered previously? No, I haven't. This is my first foray. It's my first foray into a MOOC in general. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that, that's interesting. Uh, so you haven't been spoiled or, uh, yes, I'll use the word spoiled by Coursera or edX or anything like that. Um, I've done some like uh, non-synchronous stuff with Coursera and I'm, oh, yeah. I'm currently in a part-time, you know, formal university online program. Sure. Nothing, nothing unique like. Okay. Uh, well, Technically, I think everything offered by Coursera is a quote-unquote MOOC, but of course that, that's less and less true perhaps as time goes by. Um, now, I'm just going to shift my screen here. Uh, okay, we have one person watching the YouTube stream. So we do have a fifth person, but they're, they're just not visible to us. Um, so I'm just, oops, I minimized our chat. Um, so I'm just moving my uh, my stuff around so that I can see the chat on the YouTube channel. Uh, the YouTube channel is at least a minute behind us, maybe more, uh, which I find very interesting. So I guess there's some signal processing happening there. I'm learning all kinds of stuff about how all this works. Um, I really, I didn't expect uh, Zoom to have a live stream mode, but as soon as I saw it, I knew I wanted it uh, because what my original plan was, was to uh, do the Zoom conversation on the desktop and then use an application called Open Broadcaster Systems to uh, pick up my desk, my screen activity, and then transmit that to YouTube. And that would have meant twice the bandwidth uh, on my end. And that would have probably ruined <laughs> all the effect. Um, but this seems to be working pretty well. Um, so, this is for, for Bernie and Margaret, especially. I know Matthias has taken many of these MOOCs before. He's an old hand at it. Uh, and he, he spends more time correcting me and telling me that there are things broken on the site and so on than, than anything. But uh, taking a C MOOC is very different. Um, and, and let me outline a couple of the major things that makes it different. Uh, if I may, can I ask a question here? Yeah. Uh, Stephen, I, I did take a MOOC of, of five years or so ago um, on how to be a good online teacher. It was by some Italian, com- 
Italian university or something. It was really good and I enjoyed it. So, uh, oh. if, so that's, I have taken a MOOC and it was, it was, it was good. Oh, good. I wonder if, uh, I wonder if that was through Emma. Yes. Yes. Emma. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That, that's, that's wonderful because I did some work with them. They're based in, uh, Naples. Uh, and there are really good people down there. And I, I had the opportunity to visit with them a number of times and I really miss Naples. <laughs> I, I miss the pizza, especially in Naples. I'm, a, I'm now a pizza purist. <laughs> oh, good. So, okay. So, uh, we have a list of topics and, you know, those are the, uh, the eight modules of the course, nine if we include this one. But it's not really a curriculum traditionally defined. Um, it's probably better to think of the list of modules or the list of topics that we're covering as a list of things that I want to talk about. And I'm inviting all of you to talk about them with me. Um, now, because there's no real centralized control, there's no requirement that you talk about these particular topics, uh, you know, I mean, because the MOOC sort of brings together a bunch of people who are, are sharing resources with each other, etc. and you might go off on a tangent, and there's nothing I can do to stop that and nothing I want to do to stop that. So uh, if, if the participants in the MOOC decide to abandon the course outline completely and go in a different direction, that's actually fine with me. I'll still keep talking about the things I wanna talk about because I'm stubborn that way. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I'll probably have comments on what you're talking about too, or maybe not, who knows. So in a sense, you know, although there's a list of things I want to talk about, in a sense, it's like uh, I'm an equal participant in a conversation with you, although I am talking about a bunch of certain things. And this was modeled, you know, the, the original MOOC that we created back in 2008 explicitly use this model. This was modeled on how uh, courses were offered way back, you know, uh, in the, uh, I don't want to say early days, because early days goes back to the 1500s, but, but before now, at places like Oxford and Cambridge and whatever, at least as I've interpreted that process, because of course I was never there and I didn't do deep reading on that. But, but the idea was that students attended these universities and they formed themselves into learning societies and in some cases secret societies, but mostly learning society. So you'd have the society for analytical philosophy or society for consciousness and thought or whatever. Most of my knowledge about this process comes from the world of philosophy. Um, and so they'd self-organize their own studies. They'd each, now one of the things that Oxford and Cambridge can offer that I can't is the students also worked with an individual professor uh, who would be their main mentor and leader through the whole process. But, but other than that, um, so I can't do that. But the way these societies would work is they would cajole or convince one of the professors to offer a series of lectures on a topic, AKA a course of lectures, which to me is where the word course comes from. It's just a course of lectures, a series of lectures on a topic. And uh, the uh, professor, because it's their job, uh, would reluctantly agree it takes away from their research and their one-on-one -on -one work with students and show up in the classroom uh, or more, more accurately an auditorium hall 
and deliver these lectures. And so you had some very, you know, through history, you've had some very famous courses of lectures offered by these philosophers. The, the Ludwig Wittgenstein lectures, I believe that they were at Oxford, but I'm not sure. It's either Oxford or Cambridge, it's wherever Bertrand Russell was and G.E. Moore was and a bunch of the others. Um, you know, there was one apocryphal story where he walked into the lecture theater. And of course, there, there are some people in the lecture theater, G.E.M. Anscombe and a bunch of others. Uh, and he walked in, he went to speak, and he went, hmm. He sat there, he thought for about a half an hour, and then he abruptly turned around and left. Uh, I won't do that to you, <laughs> but I res reserve the right to. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, the, these things sometimes descended into popularity contests. And there's the, the story of, you know, um, Hegel would attract huge audiences to his lectures. And in the same university, at the same time, Arthur Schopenhauer would attract a small, paltry crowd of people. So, um, but that's the idea, right? And then what the students would do after that is they'd take the content of these lectures and they do whatever they wanted with it. You know, they, they would take copious notes. And most of what we have of Ludwig Wittgenstein's philosophy today, in fact, you know, almost all of it comes from the notes of his students. Because Wittgenstein, like me, um, wasn't big in writing books, but he would write a whole series of notes um, and, and then organize and rearrange all of these notes. So after his death, students had access to their notes, notebooks, uh, to Wittgenstein's notes and, uh, and that whole pile of stuff. And so they organized his books. Um, I'm sort of like that with my OL dailies. I've got 30,000 individual little notes that uh, if I ever become as famous as Wittgenstein, somebody can sort into real thinking. Uh, and, and this course kind of works that way too, where I'll throw out notes and thoughts and things like that. But again, because it's a MOOC, a C MOOC, I invite you to do that too. So we actually get not just one person's set of notes, individual thoughts, but we get a group of people's set of notes and thoughts, and then we can reorganize them, respond to them back and forth, et cetera. So that was the overall model of the MOOC when we first started. And it, it actually worked really well when we, we had 2,200 people. It doesn't work as well with a smaller MOOC. Um, and so then we get more push to do something more formal and structured. But, you know, I, I always remain hopeful. Um, I read this morning about someone doing AI in a MOOC where they cheated a bit uh, because they wanted to test, you know, how the AI could respond to what people were saying in the MOOC in order to meet learning needs. And that's a good idea. Um, but instead of actually offering a MOOC and doing it in real life, they created a simulation of a 1,000 person MOOC. And I thought, what a great idea. I wouldn't have to actually offer MOOCs at all in the future. I just run a simulation on my MOOC and it'll have a thousand people and therefore be successful <laughs> and then draw all kinds of conclusions from that. Uh, I thought that was, that was pretty funny. So that's the first aspect of it. And, and that's why I ask people to create their own, uh, their own blogs and to contribute uh, you know, by writing in the blog. It doesn't matter really to me if people write in the blog or write in Twitter. People haven't been writing in Twitter, so I guess it matters a little bit. Um, uh, but actually, we... 
in the early days, and I continue to this day, have encouraged people to you know use whatever forum works for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've sort of settled into blogs over time because a lot of it, and it's sort of funny, a, a lot of these alternative forums have sort of fallen into disuse. Uh, for example, um, in the early days, people created groups in, in Google Groups and had nice threaded discussions where they argued with each other and with us and with strangers who would come by. Uh, and that was really good. And I'm not sure I could do it now, but I was able back then to bring in the RSS from the Google Groups as well and put them in the newsletter. And I did that. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't as structured and as neat as the blog post, but it was still pretty interesting stuff. Um, we had another group even created their own island in Second Life. That was back when Second Life was a thing. There was no way to aggregate that. Um, but, you know, uh, there are limits to everything. I still still feel that way. You know, I, I want people to use any platform that they want. And if a method exists to bring the content from that platform to the course, then I'll make that happen. Um, sometimes it means I have to write some software, but, but happily I can write the software to do that. And it, it sort of makes an interesting sideline to them, the whole MOOC experience, at least for me. Um, again, works better with more people than rather than fewer people. Mm-hmm. Uh, now we have, we're up to about 120 people signed up for the uh, email newsletter. Um, of course, I said explicitly, you don't have to sign up for the email newsletter. Um, so I'm hoping some people took me at my word on that and are subscribing to the course through RSS. I have no idea how many people have subscribed through RSS. I could look it up on Feedly maybe, but uh, you know, I imagine it's fewer than email newsletters. So that gives us an idea of the size of this course. So it's kind of smallish. So, in other words, uh, it's a MOOC in uh, affordances only, (laughs) as opposed to um, achievement. But, you know, to me, it's not about how many people have signed up. It never is. I was perfectly prepared, and I would have done it and still will do it in the future if it comes up, to do this session live on Zoom all by myself. Uh, It would not be the first time I've done a session with zero people in the audience, and I'm sure it won't be the last. Mm -hmm. So, Andy, that's the first part of this. So any, any thoughts and questions on all of that so far? No. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so the second thing I've added to this, and I experimented with this for the first time in 2018, which was my previous MOOC. It's been that long since I offered a MOOC. I keep meaning to do one and I keep not doing it. So I was sort of like kicking myself and forcing myself to do this one. because. Um, So, and a big thing about uh, learning online is that it needs to be more than just consuming content Mm -hmm. uh, and more than just seminars like this, even. Yeah. Uh, uh, You know, I actually have breakout rooms enabled. So I'll be breaking you into four breakout rooms later. No, I won't. (laughs) Hi, Keith. Um, we have Keith joining us as connecting to audio at the moment, so I'm not sure how that'll work out. Uh, with all those dire warnings from Zoom coming in my email, uh, I'm still waiting for these interlopers on the web to come and bomb our, our, our Zoom <laughs> meeting. I've, I've, I've never experienced Zoom bombing, so I'm kind of looking forward to that. But it hasn't happened yet, unless, Keith, you're a Zoom bomber. But I don't think you are because you immediately came in, no video, and your microphone muted. So 
muted, not mooted. Um, oh, there you are. Hi, Keith. <laughs> Can't see you now on video. But you're not presenting as a Zoom bomber. You're presenting as an interested and engaged participant. So welcome. Um, so again, feel free to jump in with audio at any point. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I've discovered that if I speak, it's sort of uh, the, the, the technical term is ducking. Uh, it'll reduce the vo it'll reduce the volume of anyone else's speech, so I can talk over you. It's interesting that Zoom has auto ducking for for the presenter. Um, anyhow, so should be more than just discussions like this. Should be more than just reading content. There should be activities. Um, so I was inspired by Jim Groom. Um, who offered a course called Digital Storytelling 106, DS 106, at Mary Washington University in the US somewhere. I think it's in Maryland or something. I should know this, but I don't. Uh, and it doesn't matter where it is. But um, what matters is that it's a real university. So he always had. Uh, a largish group of people uh, who really participated because they needed to get course grades. I have no such inducements uh, to offer. But um, what he did is for activities in the course, he set up an activity bank. Now DS106 is all about digital storytelling. So the activities all revolved around that. But the idea is that participants in the course could contribute activities to the course where if people did those activities rather than pre-selected activities, that would count as part of their course grade. So I tried that in um, eLearning 3.0. Now in eLearning 3.0, I had about the same uh, participation as in this MOOC, which should have been a warning, but um, so what happened was, uh, I created a bunch of activities and uh, those were the only activities in the course. Nobody contributed more. Um, and that's, you know, I would maybe 10 years ago, I would have taken that personally, but uh, I think that's a really common phenomenon. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to get people to participate in that way unless you know, it's uh, giving them a better way to get grades in your course toward a degree. Um, nonetheless, um, I've, or I have, I, I should be more accurate with my tenses. I am in the process of creating activities for this course as well. So for each module over time, you'll see a list of activities. Uh, I will set up a form so that people can contribute their own activities so that we'll have the equivalent of an activity bank in this course. Uh, it's something that I want my platform to support anyways. Um, and I think it's a good idea. I think it's a great idea, in fact, and that's why I wanted to steal it from Jim Grimm. So, but how to induce people to do the activities because that's the other side of it. Now, a lot of people just did the activities because they're engaged and interested in the course. And I'm, I'm hoping people will do that here. I gave them really hard activities in eLearning 3.0, you know, like, um, you know, uh, set up a Brave browser and use it to publish content into the interplanetary file system, then access that content through a distributed file reading tool, stuff like that. It was horrible. Um, but people did it. Um, and, and, you know, I was really encouraged by that. Um, I'll probably do that course again sometime in the future. And I think the tools will have improved by that. I'm sure they will have, at least some of them. So, uh, but I still wanted to provide some sort of inducement. And at the time in 2018, everybody was talking about micro learning and badges. So I spent some time, integrated the course with Badger and uh, 
created a mechanism whereby as people submitted their uh, blog posts or whatever through the RSS feed, I could read those and award them a badge for a particular module. And I'm setting that up again here for this course. Hmm. Um, now in my perfect world, a lot of this would happen automatically. <laughs> um, and, and specifically, two things would happen automatically. Number one, um, you working in your own environment would not need to indicate that this work applies to this task in this module. Uh, the system would just detect that that's what you're doing. Um, but if you're working on you know, WordPress or Blogger or whatever, as you know, these systems don't do that. They haven't a clue what you're writing about. Um, so it's helpful if you indicate what module, what task you're working toward, if that's what you're doing. Uh, even if you don't do that, as I read your posts, and obviously I'll be able to easily read everybody's posts uh, because we don't have 2,000 people contributing posts. Uh, if it qualifies for a badge, I'll still award it for the badge. Um, so you might be getting badges you didn't actually apply for. <laughs> uh, I'm proactive that way. Um, but you can see why, like, like in a MOOC, every personal intervention is a, um, is a bottleneck, right? Um, so, because a person who's looking at things and deciding whether or not to award badges, uh, they have an upper limit of how many things they can look at. You, you're all in education. You know about that. If you're like me, uh, you've probably sat down once upon a time with the proverbial vertical feet of marking to do. Uh, and that is a vivid illustration of the upper limits of, of how much sort of stuff you can do. Um, so, you know, ideally in a proper MOOC, the MOOC itself would determine whether or not your contribution is a submission for a task. And there are two ways to do it. Either uh, the system itself recognizes it or you indicate that it is, and then the system reads that you've indicated it. So that's on my, that's in the back of my mind as something I want my system to do eventually, but right now it doesn't do that. And it's largely because um, you guys are using tools that are outside my control, so I can't make them do that. The other thing is the actual marking of these things. By marking, what I mean is it qualifies for a badge or it doesn't. Uh, and again, I'll just hit the button to award the badge. I can make that automatic. Um, but, you know, eventually it would be something, I don't know if I could ever write this, but it would be an artificial intelligence of some sort saying, does this piece of writing satisfy the conditions of that badge? match them and see. That's an interesting problem. And, and that's actually looking at some of the content of this course even. So I may be exploring that, uh, at least in concept. Uh, I don't know if I can do it in actual practical reality in the, in the scope of time that we have, but you know that sort of thing is, is something worth thinking about. So I've added that aspect to the course and, and part of what's causing my system to crash at the moment is making all of these pieces work together. Because here's the other thing about a connectivist MOOC, and now we're on to the third topic. Um, it's non-linear. Um, and I know it seems linear because we have a series of one through eight modules. Um, and that's because the MOOC takes place in time and time, at least as we know it, is linear. Um, you know, I do philosophy, so I'm perfectly prepared to contemplate the existence of nonlinear time. Um, 
however that would work but but you know there's there's certain practical limitations to thinking of time as non-linear so for the purposes of this course time is linear um how many other courses where you do you get that right for the purposes of this course we will say that time is linear <laughs> And so, so there is an unavoidably linear element to it. But after that, the course is nonlinear. The course is structured or set up uh, as a graph. Um, and the, the extent of that graph, I'm not sure how that'll work exactly yet. The, the graph sort of grows. Now, when I say graph, what I mean by that is that um, there are a bunch of different entities in the course and I have different types of entities. I have um, modules, I have posts, in fact, different types of posts, uh, presentations, uh, events, people, authors, links, which is what you're providing. You're, you show up in the course graph as authors, because you author stuff, and uh, as links, because that's what you author, and more. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different types of entities. So uh, my application, which is called Grasshopper, what it does in the background is it takes these entities and draws a link between them. So anytime you submit something, it actually creates, uh, it creates a link, which is a thing that you submitted. Uh, there's a feed, which is your blog just thought of generally and an author. So there's three things there. So author aligned to feed and aligned to uh, link and then back to author. So those are three entities which are connected. So you have entities and connections between these entities. And that's what forms a graph. A graph just is entities connected together. So the whole course is structured like that. Now, in the past, that structuring has been limited to the actual practical presentation of the course. I have in my mind, the idea of extending that to the content of the course as well. So for example, uh, in the, in the uh, second module, we'll be looking at applications of artificial intelligence. So I'm going to make each application properly so-called a node or an entity in the graph. And there will be, I don't know, there's 40 or 50 of them. Um, and, and, and we'll talk about those. So have each of these activities and then uh, in, including but not limited to the posts that you create, we'll have links that are associated with these activities. So have, maybe I shouldn't call them activities or not activities, applications, I'll call them applications. Um, so there'll be an application of AI connected to a link, connected to a person, connected to maybe an external feed, whatever. Then in the next section, we'll be doing issues related to AI. So again, my thinking is I'll make each issue a node in the graph and then issues might relate to applications, might relate to resources, etc. cetera. Uh, something like that. Now this is, uh, so this is kind of meta, right? Because the topic of the course is specifically these applications, these issues, these theories of ethics, uh, et cetera, that we're going to be looking at. Uh, in, in the third module, we'll look at ethical codes. I've got something like 40 or 50 ethical codes that I've looked at and analyzed over the years. Each one of those will be an entity. Um, and then we can link them together. So, so, 
what that'll give us is, first of all, it gives us a way of thinking about this material, which is kind of nonlinear. We can think of it in a more global or comprehensive way. Um, and I'll try to be, uh, well, my intention is to provide ways of accessing these um, that make them more accessible, uh, make them easier to comprehend. Because uh, right now it's, you know, if you ask, what are the issues in artificial intelligence? It's easy to get mushy in a hurry. And by mushy, I mean vague, imprecise, not really sure about what the domains are. You know what I mean? Um, but after the course, ideally, you will be able to go, well, there are four major types of issues, two of which are caused by this, two of which are caused by that. We break these down you know, or whatever. You, know, you can talk about these issues intelligently and in such a way that you're able to discuss them comprehensively, you know, rather than saying the issue in AI is this particular thing, uh, which is what we see mostly in my experience, uh, by looking at them as this graph related, you know, still more holistically, we're able to talk about all of the issues or what the issues in general represent or whatever. I don't know what it will turn out to be because that's how a CMOOC works, right? I don't know what we'll learn. Um, we have this topic area. We're going to look at it. We're going to wrestle with it. And by thinking of the content as a graph, by thinking of ourselves as part of that graph, um, what we learn will, in the technical term, is emerge from the graph. We will begin to see patterns. We will begin to see regularities. Uh, the idea is that we come out of this course being able to recognize themes, ideas, etc., in the literature or whatever. And I have found through my own experience, when I work this way, then, then when I sit down to read, say, a new article uh, or, you know, a new publication or new study, I'm sitting there going, oh, yeah, that's one of those. That's one of those. That's one of those. You know, I recognize and, and I'm able to place this in the larger model simply by my previous work in this field. And, I, and that's how I've worked generally. And that's how I work specifically in any particular domain. And so it's that sort of practice that I'm trying to engender in the course. And yeah, that part of my software is broken right now. <laughs> uh, so, and, and specifically where um, I use the graph, like I have say a presentation and I use the graph to associate it with a module and then present that. That's a simple direct association. That part is broken. Uh, and it's, it's, I have a typo or, um, or some badly phrased bit of code somewhere in there in the piece that presents web pages and it's probably sending it into an endless loop. But that's the thought. Thoughts on that? Sounds interesting. Let's uh, see how it builds. Yeah. It's, again, not the usual way of presenting a course because the usual way of presenting a course is I would give you some learning outcomes, mm -hmm. right? And then mm -hmm. you would, and I would structure the activities to produce these outcomes in you, and mm -hmm. then you would achieve these. I can't do that because I don't know what the learning outcomes are. So, and actually the activities, you know, you sort of think about what the activities could be. Um, well, if there were 2,000 of us, I'd say, okay, each person in the course draw an association, you know, do, do some associating, right? Look at, say, an ethical code and map it to the issues that it addresses. And I'd give you a tool to do that. I may still do that. I think that would be fun. 
Um, so things like that, or as always, um, you know, here's a topic area, uh, you know, like a type of application, find examples out in the world of that, uh, list them in your blog. And so that when you feed them in, uh, when you write it, it'll, the system will analyze your blog, find these activities that are these examples and map them to that application. Hard to describe, but, but um, when we get to that point, uh, I mean, part of my responsibility is to make that particular task as clear as possible. So, um, of course, again, the utility of these tasks is greatly increased with a larger number of people. But nonetheless, we'll still be able to produce interesting results, even with a small group of people doing some of this work. Uh, and even if nobody does any work, I've got a whole bunch of links that I can associate with things anyways. So you'll still get this really interesting resource that you can use. I see Bernie is done taking a call. <laughs> so uh, we're almost out of time, but there's a fourth thing as well about this. Um, and, and Matthias is well aware of this and, and possibly Keith as well. Um, and that's the, 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 uh, the openness of it. Now we're doing this in, uh, like we're live streaming this conversation, for example, and that's, gee, maybe I, maybe I should talk about, oh, I got a thumbs up from Matthias, all right, or from Keith rather, cool. Um, so I was just thinking like he could have uh, openness level one, openness level two, because educators love levels of things, but maybe I won't do that, um, or dimension. But okay, this is level one openness, the actual conversation we're having, which I'm sorry is a bit one-sided, but we'll live with that for now. Anyways, later on, I'm hoping all of you tell me much more than I tell you, but um, that's you know pretty immediate, obvious openness. We're live streaming on YouTube. Any number of people could be listening on YouTube. Uh, in fact, two are watching now. Bonus, we double our audience. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, and any number of people can watch the video later on into posterity. Uh, so that's one type of openness. But uh, another type of openness is that the, if you will, assets of the course uh, are intended to be available for reuse by other people uh, in the future. Now, by the assets, every individual entity that or, or artifact that's a part of the course is available for reuse. And now I, I always, uh, I always uh, use a non-commercial license, but that's just me, but honestly, I don't care. Um, but it's, you know, I, it just slows them down a bit. Um, but uh, so, you know, all, all of the posts, the videos, the contributions, now your contributions, that's up to you. Uh, you can license them however you want and this course will respect that license. Now, presumably when you put it in a feed, allow the course to harvest it, you're at least giving me permission to link back to whatever it is. Uh, I do have copies of the resources in the course database, but ultimately what really matters is the original that you've produced. The copy I have is, uh, simply to make it easier to do some functions with it. But it's not like my intent is to display your content on my website. That's not the point. Uh, in fact, it's even, it's actually the anti point. I don't want to do that. Uh, I want the content to be distributed and out there in the world so that if for some reason 
uh, Grasshopper or my website or whatever blows up or has a catastrophic failure at the server side, which could happen, uh, all this other content exists somewhere and, uh, and continues to exist after the course is finished. So that's the second level of openness. Um, but there's a third level of openness, which is the metadata about the course. Um, and some examples of that, the list of feeds that's harvested. Um, so this list of feeds is made available in a format called OPML. And what that means is that any person with an RSS reader can get this file, OPML file, which is the list of feeds, loaded into their own RSS reader, and they can follow everybody's feeds, including the course feed, without ever actually interacting with the course itself. So that's a different kind of openness. It takes it even a step further, right? So. Um, the list of links in the course, the list of posts in the course, I would say not the list of people, because I don't know who's registered, but those who have volunteered to be authors, that list, um, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm not sure what other lists there would be, but any type of data in the course, there's a list of entities of that type of data, the list of applications of AI. Uh, will be made available. Now, there's no OPML for that, but there is a standard format called JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. And so all of these lists will be made available in that. What can be done with that? Well, I don't know, uh, but something, right? Um, so a simple example, somebody who's creating a website could take the list of all the links or the list of all the applications or the list of all of the issues, create their own website such that it reads that JSON list, formats it in HTML, presents it as a nice list. Um, or they could set up a little search website so that it reads that list and you can type in a search term and it finds that in the list of JSON. And they can do that without really knowing a whole lot of programming. Um, and they, they wouldn't even need a web server to do that. They, they could probably do that right on their own desktop. So that's another level of openness, right? So, and all of this will be available to you either as a web resource or as a search interface or whatever. So, uh, you know, in the future, if uh, you're wondering, you know, somebody says, well, is there an issue about uh, AI or analytics that has to do with um, diseases? You can do a search on the list of things that we have um, and say yes or no. So what, what was that, the third level? I lost track of my levels. But there's a fourth level. <laughs> and the fourth level is the graph itself. The, the list of all of these links between types of entities, that also is open. Um, and that's published as... Um, well, there's different ways of publishing it. I will publish it as JSON. Um, there's also, I have a thing that I use called graph markup language. Uh, Matthias, one of the things that he does is he takes these graphs and imports it into one of his own programs that produces all kinds of diagrams and tables. Uh, this information can be imported, inputted into a graph database so that you can do searches on it. Now, we might do that, we might not, I don't know. It might be taking the whole thing a bit too far. We do need to focus on the topic as opposed to neat things to do with graphs, um, which is a different course. But the idea is that 
when you're doing your search, you're not just searching through the properties of the list of items, like say the list of applications of AI, but you're searching through the properties of the list of items and the things that list is related to, a first order search, and the things those things are related to, a second order search, and so on. So you can get very sophisticated searches of these graphs. So part of the objective of the course is to create this graph of applications, issues, codes, etc., related to artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence slash analytics in e-learning. Uh, so that's and make that open. Um, and then there's probably a fifth level of openness beyond those fourth levels of openness, but I don't know what it is yet, um, but it'll be something. Um, so, and that's, you know, you know, we, George Siemens and I and others, Dave Cormier and a bunch of, you know, a whole bunch of people, it wasn't just us, built the first massive open online course. And, uh, it was massive, but massive is, you know, just, it's an aspirational thing. It doesn't have to be massive. It can be massive by affordance, much like this course. Um, and it was online, definitely. And it was a course in the sense of a series of lectures. But the key thing for us was open. We're using open resources, bringing in open resources, uh, maybe that's level minus one that we use resources that are open to actually create the course itself. But then, you know, the, the ongoing process of the course and the production of artifacts of the course, that's all open as well to produce a, a longer lasting, more robust resource. You know, and those, those original conductivist courses are still available and they're still used by people as resources. And uh, ideally, this course would be used as a resource by people working on uh, these topics in the future. If it's a good course. If it's not a good course, it'll be forgotten and languish in obscurity until eventually somebody unplugs the server. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's the risk we run in academia, but it's a risk well worth taking to my mind. So that's the process uh, of taking a MOOC, right? You're not taking a course to learn a bunch of stuff, although you probably will. Uh, you're involved in this conversation, in this project, in this act of network building, both among ourselves, but also of resources and topics and all of that. What do you think? <clears throat> Looking forward to it, Stephen. Nice to see you. Nice to see the other people too. I'm uh, really looking forward to uh, connecting with uh, the other people in the course in any way possible. And uh, I like the fact that uh, we don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. And, uh, that's, that, that's exactly what I like. I like that idea. Any other thoughts, Margaret? Yeah, yeah I, I was involved with both the first Connectivist MOOC, the first one that you and George and uh, Dave did, and on eLearning 3.0. And I thoroughly enjoyed the experiences. Um, the eLearning 3.0 I described to the people I work with as it really hurt my head. But... <laughs> it's important to have learning experiences that hurt your head because otherwise you coast through in a big echo chamber. And I, one of the things I like about the model that you provide, Stephen, is you have to challenge yourself because it's too easy to consume. So you have to consume in a way where you can create something new for that. So I've got high hopes for this because... I really enjoyed the last two that I've been involved with. So, you know, looking forward to this. Margaret, any thoughts? I'm um, really just seconding what Bernie and Casey said. I'm looking forward to looking at the dynamics between different people, different perspectives, different ideas. Okay. Uh, great. 
that takes us to one o'clock and I want to be, if nothing else, punctual because for the purposes of this course, time is linear. <laughs> um, so um, the next live session um, will be the introduction to module one, not on Monday because Monday is a holiday here in Canada. So on Tuesday, October the 12th, just verifying. Yes, Tuesday, October the 12th at uh, 12 noon Eastern Daylight Time. So we'll see you all then. Okay. Bye.